So I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's been a little bit of chaos in our world really the past few months. Now, some of this is macro chaos with pandemics and stuff like that. Some of it's a little more micro kind of individually in our home. We've gone from COVID pandemic to is there going to be SEC football? Are the kids ever going to go back to school? And virtual learning is just kind of like out the wazoo. There's been racial tension. There's been tropical storms, Saharan dust storms. There's just been chaos all over the place. And one thing we've learned in the midst of all this chaos is everyone's compass, culturally, relationally, racially, religiously, all kind of point a little bit different direction. Now, I kind of grew up being obsessed with maps and geography and GPS and compasses. Actually, every time my family would stop on a vacation at a truck stop or a Shoney's, and may Shoney's rest in peace, I would actually pick up a map because I was just obsessed with roads and directions and all this stuff. So much so that my grandpa gave me a compass whenever I was little, and I would take it everywhere I went because, I mean, you never know when you might get lost. Now, the thing is about a compass, if you point it to north, and you continually walk that same direction, not veering one way or the other, eventually you'll get to the true north, right? To the North Pole. Well, actually, you don't. Because most, if not all, compasses actually work off of a magnet. And magnetic north is actually different than true north. Magnetic north is not the North Pole where Santa Claus lives. Magnetic north is actually a place in Arctic Canada where there are iron ores underneath the surface of the earth, and that's what pulls the magnet there. And the problem with this is, is actually when you're in different places in the world, north is, magnetic north is actually different from where you are. And if you don't realize this, one really quick way you can show the true north and magnetic north are different is pull out two iPhones. You're going to see the picture beside me. If you go to your settings and set one to true north and leave the other on magnetic north and lay them down, their degrees difference will read differently. I'm telling you, try it. How crazy is that? And magnetic north can be anywhere from 5 to 20 degrees off from true north. North And true north and magnetic north never really intersect. And you're probably thinking, why in the world are you telling me this? Do you want us to share in your obsession with maps and with GPS and compasses? Like, why, why are you telling us this? I'm telling you this because I think it is a great illustration of where we are in our world today. Because too often we get off of true north and we begun, began to become attracted and pulled and distracted toward the magnetic north around us. We're pulled into religion. We're pulled by fear. We're pulled by politics. We're pulled by the thoughts of pandemic. We're pulled by selfish, self-interest thoughts. And before too long, we're just a little bit off course. We're not heading directly towards true north. And you might be thinking, you know what, I'm still heading north-ish, which is better than south-ish, so that I'm, I'm good, right? It, what, why does it even really matter? Well, the thing is, guys, it matters more than you could ever even imagine. Because if you get off and you're in an airplane, you get off by one degree, every hour you fly, you'll be off one mile, then two miles, then three miles, and four miles. And on a small kind of scale of things, it doesn't really seem that long. But what if you were with Elon Musk, you're getting ready on SpaceX, and you're headed to the moon? What happened if you were just one degree off there headed to the moon? You'd actually miss the moon by 4,169 miles. Imagine having a lifetime of just being one, two, or maybe even three degrees off course. It's so dangerous when we begin to just deflect and drift just a little bit. The longer it goes, the further we get off course. And what has been shown to us in the midst of COVID is some of us have been actually way off course for a very, very long time. And COVID has really revealed that to us. For some of us, this pandemic has caused us to get off course. And we're seeing the effects and the drift in our marriages and our spirituality with our kids, with our finances, with tons of different things in our life. And without realizing it, we realize we are out in the middle of nowhere. We've lost our course and we have moved so far away from what we even know to be true. And the thing is, this causes us to not have much confidence in anything at all. 
And really the only thing in the midst of COVID that we have confidence in is we're confident no one is confident about what's happening over the next few months or years. So the question is, what do we do in the midst of this chaos? What do we do to get off of Magnetic North? How do we find true north? And if you're asking these questions in your life of, how do I know what's next? How do I know I'm going the right direction? How do I have confidence in the midst of all this stuff? I'm so glad you're here today because today we're going to see what true north is. Actually, we're going to see who true north is and his name is Jesus. And we're going to see not just who he is, but how to get focused on him and actually the difference it makes in our life. And we're going to see in the midst of this chaos, we can actually have confidence because of who Jesus is and what he did for us. And that's actually what the series we've been in, in the book of 1 John, what John was talking all about in his letter to the first century Christians. He was saying, look, there are going to be so many magnetic pulls in your life. Some of it for them was Gnosticism and Docetism and all this stuff. But there's always things trying to pull us away from Jesus. And there have been questions since the first century and misunderstandings about who Jesus is. He's become politicized, religionized, personalized. And John is saying, no, this is who he is. Let's get Jesus right. Because if we get Jesus wrong, we've said this from the get-go, we get love wrong. In our reality, if we get Jesus wrong, we get everything wrong. But in the context of 1 John, John is saying, if you get Jesus wrong, you get love wrong. But the beautiful thing is, guys, if we get Jesus right, if we get focused back on true north, if we get Jesus right, we get everything right. And it only begins to affect our life and affect relationships with other people. It truly begins to point other people to Jesus because who we know will always show. And if we're focused on true north, we can help other people get focused there as well. So if you're here today, maybe for the first time ever, maybe you really don't even know who Jesus is, I'm so glad you're here because John is going to show us this is who Jesus is. This is true north. This is how you head that direction. And this is the difference it can make in your life. And maybe for the first time in many, many months, we can leave today having confidence in the midst of chaos. So to finish our series today, we're going to dive into 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse 13 and ending the book at verse 21. And this is kind of what John would call the postscript or the summary. He takes all of these written in that first four and a half and five chapters and puts it all in and says, this is what I want you to leave with. And I'm actually going to read through the whole entire passage and then we'll go back through piece by piece and walk through what does it look like to focus on Jesus as a true north? And again, how does that instill confidence in us? So look at me at 1 John Chapter 5, starting in verse 13. John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have it from Him. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. And I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death, because there is a sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin, but the one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come, and has given us an understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. I want to pray over our passage today, and then we're going to dive in. Father, I pray today that you would honor our prayer, that you would hear our prayer, and that you would answer it to allow us to see Jesus as our true north to understand who he is and what he did for us. And God, allow that to bring us into an incredible relationship with you, trusting and knowing that you are good and knowing that we can have confidence in the midst of chaos. Father, we love you. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So to walk back through this passage, I don't really want to start at verse 13. I actually want to start in verse 20 because I think that's the crux of everything here and gives us the lens to walk back through. How do we have confidence in the midst of chaos? John writes this. We know also that the Son of God has come. We know also that the Son of God has come. Now this is really, really exciting for me because one, this shows us who Jesus is. It says, look, Jesus is the Son of God. He wasn't just a good guy. He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a healer. He actually is the Son of God. This is the epicenter of what we believe as Christians. But he wasn't just the Son of God. It says the Son of God has come. And that's actually present tense. So the Son of God is come. He has come and is still coming for you and for me. And John wants us to see Guys, no matter what we're facing in our life, no matter if it's pain, hurt, crazy kids at home screaming about virtual learning, no matter what we're facing in our life, Jesus is still here pursuing us, coming for us. And he came to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for your sin, for mine, and then to defeat it all, guys, when he gave his life on the cross and rose from the dead. And that is why He came. He came for one singular purpose, for redemption and reconciliation. Jesus came to make us right with God so that we could have a relationship with the Father. That's why Jesus has come. That's why Jesus is come. That's what it looks like to see Jesus as the true north. But John keeps going even further. He says the Son of God has come, but He didn't didn't just come. He has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is is true. And that's one of the big words John has been using his whole book is know Jesus. That's that's that confidence we have is when we know Jesus. And this word that John uses for know is actually the Greek word gnosko, which doesn't mean anything. It's used kind of like a hill of beans, but it is a true rich word in the original language because it's not just knowing about, it's actually knowing someone. It's like me knowing a lot about my wife. I could know her birthday. I could know the things she likes, her favorite flavor of ice cream that she loves, brownies. I could know a lot about her. But when I begin to truly experience her and understand her, that's when I truly begin to know. And John is saying that's why Jesus came, because knowing is greater than knowing about. And guys, and this is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Everything else was go to God, learn more about God, learn more about this religious being. And Christianity is God came to us so that we could know Him and be in relationship with Him. That's what it looks like to follow the true north. But John keeps going and it gets even better. He says, given us understanding so that we may know Him, the one who is true. And not just knowing Him, actually be in Him. He says, and we are in Him who is true by being in His Son, Jesus Christ. I love this. We don't just know Jesus, guys. We are actually in Him. Once we say yes to following Jesus, we are safe, secure, and forever His. And no matter what we face on this earth, no matter who we face on this earth, we can know with confidence we are in Jesus Christ. And I love, again, that term, true there. Because in our world today, there's subjective truth, relative truth, all this kind of different truth. As John is saying, no, 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 no. There is an absolute truth, and his name is Jesus. That's why he is our true north. And we, if we follow him, get to actually be in him. You actually get to be in him for a purpose. Look at the last part of verse 20. It says, he is the true God and eternal life. And I love this part. Because Jesus, guys, isn't just the son of God. Jesus is God. Jesus is what I like to call God in a bod. God came to earth, fully human, fully God, to come to live, to die, and to conquer death and conquer sin. And in Jesus being God, again, is a huge central facet of Christianity. He had to be fully human to die in our place, but he had to be fully divine in order to conquer death so that we might have life in him. And John says that's exactly why he came, was to give us eternal life. So if we know who Jesus is, and not just know who he is, but actually know him and experience him and follow him, this is where the cool stuff happens. This is where we begin to have confidence, where we begin 
to know some incredible things about focusing on the true north. Look at me at verse 11. John says, and this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. And this is through his son. Whoever has the son has life. And whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. And I write these things to you who believe in the name of son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. So the beautiful thing is, if we know Jesus, guys, we can know that we have eternal life. We can know we have eternal life. Now, I want to kind of clarify what John means here by eternal life. He's not talking about the fountain of youth, or if you're a Harry Potter fan, the sorcerer's stone. He's not talking about that. He's talking about an everlasting life and a perfect relationship with our Heavenly Father. That's what eternal life is. Redemption for reconciliation so we can live with Him in relationship. And the beautiful thing about eternal life is, guys, it doesn't start just when we die. It starts right now in the here and the now. Once we decide to follow Jesus, eternal life begins here, right now, in this moment. And that's what Je- Jesus talked about in John chapter 10, verse 10, when He says, I've come so you can have life to the full, abundant, full life because once you're in a relationship with God that's when eternal life begins so the beautiful thing about that is no matter what happens in our life COVID no college football crazy kids at home marital issues financial issues anxiety depression hurt pain no matter what all of that we can still have joy because we know we have eternal life and the one who came and gave his life for us And no matter how scary that feels, guys, really, there is nothing to fear because no fear longer exists because Jesus has come and conquered it all. If we know Jesus, we can know we have eternal life and know that all this pain we're experiencing, all this hurt, all this chaos is temporary when we begin to look at the grand scheme of things. So we can know we have eternal life, but we can also know something else that's pretty cool. Look at me at verse 14. John says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us, and we know that He hears us, and whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of Him. John is saying this, If we know Jesus, when we know Him, we know that we can have confidence in our prayer. In other words, we can know if we pray for it, we will be heard and we will receive it. But there's an asterisk there. It's not we ask for whatever we want and we get it. It's when we ask according to His will. We can actually have confidence and we pray according to God's will. That's a prayer that will be answered. And this means as we begin to know Jesus, our heart begins to align to Jesus. And as our heart begins to align to Jesus, we begin to understand the will of God. We begin to desire the same thing God wants. So we begin to pray that direction. And the more we pray that direction, the more God answers it. The more we love Jesus, the bigger it gets. It's kind of like a slinky. It just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. That is the confidence that we can have in Jesus Christ, knowing whatever we ask according to God's will, God will deliver. And we're not asking to gratify our own wishes and our own desires. We're asking because it's all about God. It comes from Him. It is for Him. And He's wanting to work through us. But John adds a little bit extra, and for the record, it's going to get a little weird in verse 16 and 17, but it's really going to show us what the will of God is. John says, if you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give them life. Now I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Now, I told you, it's kind of weird. Like, sin that leads to death, sin that doesn't lead to death. What, what, is, what does this even mean? John is, is just saying this. God's will is if there's a brother or sister, someone who professes faith in Christ, that you see stepping into sin, pray for them because God wants them to have life. And when you pray for your brother or sister, it doesn't mean they're automatically forgiven. No, it means that God is going to interact with them and begin to draw them out of that sin because His will is for all to come to Him. So what does John mean by this sin that leads to death? 
We really don't know. Like scholars can speculate. Maybe it's for a non-believer refusing the Holy Spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's for the believer who doesn't lose their salvation but does something so bad on earth, God's like, you know what? It's time to take you home. We really don't know. And honestly, it really doesn't matter. John is showing us here an illustration that God's will is for us not to sin but to come to Him. And if we pray according to His will, we pray in that direction, God will draw people to himself. Guys, that is the confidence we can have in the midst of chaos, that if we pray according to God's will, he will hear us and he will answer. That's what happens when we stay focused on the true north. But John goes even further and it continues to get even better in verse 18. John says, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin because the one born of God keeps them safe and the evil one cannot harm them. John shows us here that if we know Jesus, when we know Jesus, guys, we can know we have victory over sin. We can know we have victory over sin. Now, this is kind of two sides of of one coin here. I want to kind of explain what's happening here. For some of you, this is incredible news. You're a follower of Jesus, but sin is still really hard to say no to. And the reality, it is, because sin's attractive. I've said from the very beginning that if you're not enjoying sin, You're doing it wrong. That is a huge magnetic pull away from true north. And sometimes you just feel overwhelmed. I know there's sin in my life or I just feel like I can't say no. And John is saying, no, if you're in Jesus, if you know him, you have victory over this sin. You can overcome it because he has already overcome the world. You are no longer a slave to that sin. God's power, God's spirit is living in you and will give you whatever it takes to step away from that sin. That's the good news, but having victory over sin. But it's also convicting on the other side of the coin that if you profess to be a follower of Jesus and you continue to sin, that's a red flag that something is wrong. Now we talked about this in week two of our message series that you know, too often we as believers can be really, really casual about sin. We kind of like to walk that fine line of, yeah, it's grace. God's going to forget. Yes, he does forgive us. But the problem with us continually sinning is, guys, we can't follow Jesus and simultaneously embrace that which he died to end. We, if we're truly following the one who gives life, we can't continually choose death over him. And if you continually find yourself in that rhythm, that's a red flag that, that something is wrong. Either you're walking away from the Lord and it's time to come back to true north, you're getting magnetic north pulling you this way, or maybe you don't know true north at all. Because guys, if we're in Jesus, if we know him, we have victory over all of this sin in our life. Now, does that mean we don't sin until we die? Absolutely not. We're not going to quit sinning until we're in glory with God in heaven. And John actually talks about this in chapter 2, verse 1. He goes, look, you're not supposed to sin, but you're still going to do it. But when you do it, we have an advocate. Because our true north is our lawyer. He's still arguing and fighting for saying, he's with me, she is with me. That's what happens when we know Jesus. We have victory over that sin. And before we move to verse 19, I just want to let you know, this is my favorite absolute part about what it means to know Jesus and the confidence we can have in him. Look at me at verse 19. John says, we know that we are children of, of God, and that the whole world is under control of the evil one. Because the beautiful thing is, if we know Jesus, we can know that we belong to God. We no longer have to work for acceptance. We no longer have to get ourselves cleaned up. We no longer have to try to fit in. We no longer have to begin to worry and think or wonder, am I loved? Now, God proved that he loved us when he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, into this world to become death for you and for me. We truly become children of God. And guys, we can't even imagine how good of a father God is. We can sing songs about it. We can try to think about it. But we cannot even begin to fathom how good of a loving father he is. Now, I will say, I believe my mind has been open to it a little bit more recently when I brought our, well, my wife brought our sweet little baby girl, Abigail, into the world. And you're going to see a picture of her over on the side. And just so you know, 
you're going to see pictures of her in, just for the rest of her life. So just, just get ready for that. But as I began to hold sweet little Abigail Moon, I began to realize there is nothing like the love of a father for his child. Now, nothing against mama's love, not saying it's better. I'm just saying there is nothing like a father's love for his child. And if you have a good dad in this world, you know that to be true. Whenever he loves you, it changes everything. And if you have a bad dad in this world, you know it is so incredibly harmful to not have a father who loves you. But I want you to know this, that you do have a father who loves you. One who is perfect, one who is pure, one who gave up everything so that you might know him. He gave up his one and only son so that he could adopt you into his family. That's how much God loves you. And that's what we can know and have confidence in no matter what chaos is happening in our life. If we know Jesus, we know that we belong to God. And ultimately, guys, just going to be honest with you, that's what it's all about. That's what the gospel is all about. That God loved us enough to send his son so that we could become sons and daughters of the Most High King. So that he could redeem us, he could reconcile us to himself, and we could have a relationship with him so we could stay focused on the true north and enjoy him and have everlasting abundant eternal life with him that is what it's all about that is why we need to stay focused on the true north but let's be honest for a minute can we can we do that at church even if it is online staying on true north is really really hard isn't it that magnetic north is a strong pull it's a strong distraction and it's a strong kind of polarizing thing that begins to pull us away. Sin feels really good. Other things we place our confidence in feel really good. Culture is really strong. Religion is really strong. Politics, oh my goodness, come November, that's going to be really, really, really strong. So how in the world do we guard against this? How do we stay focused on the true north and not be distracted by magnetic north? And it was like John knew we'd be asking this question. So he said this in verse 21. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. The end. That was it. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. The end. No, let's continue this on. No, I might get better. No, no, like the cliff. No, it's like, that's it. The end. And John is saying this because he knows how hard it will be to stay on true north because so many idols are going to pull and attract and try to pull us away from true north now when we say idols it's not just talking about little golden calves and statues you bow down to it's anything you place your confidence in other than jesus christ and i'm just gonna be honest i've struggled with this greatly over the past few months because without realizing it guys i had made speaking to you in a room with you around me an idol in my life and I began to think, you know what, I'm placing my confidence in those gatherings. I'm placing my confidence in seeing you instead of placing it in the one who came to save you and who loves you more than I ever could. I placed my own confidence and idol in my ability to deal with my depression and my anxiety by myself in the midst of this pandemic instead of focusing on True North and allowing Him to pull me out of it. Some of you have placed your confidence and other things. And COVID has shown you, yeah, that ain't going to work. It's going to fail you over and over and over. And for some of you, COVID has caused you to start new idols that you're trusting and putting your confidence in instead of Jesus. So I just want to want to ask you today, just to be really, really honest, because what, what is keeping you from true north? What What is your magnetic north? Some of that is good stuff, but it's keeping you from the best. It's keeping you from true north. And the longer you go that direction, the further you get off course. What is keeping you from that? What's distracting you? What's attracting you? What is pulling you away from Jesus? Because guys, if we focus on him, we can know that we have eternal life. We can know he hears our prayers. We can know we have victory over sin. But better than all of that, we can know we're children of God. And I just want to take a minute as we get ready to close, imagine, can you imagine what would happen if we truly begin to focus on the true north? 
Can, can you imagine not just micro, but also macro in little ways for you and your family individually, for the people around you, but also for the chapel as a whole and the church as a whole. Imagine what would happen if we begin to focus on the true north. Imagine how much nicer we'd be to each other. Like imagine how much all the other disappointments in life would seem so small. Imagine the confidence we could have with chaos. Imagine what might happen if we truly began to love God and love people. Because that's exactly what we saw in the first century. The church focused on the true north. They focused solely on Jesus and they loved God with everything they had. And they loved people in the exact same way. And it was so beautiful to the world around them. It was literally irresistible. And they went from 12 followers of Jesus to a couple hundred, to a few thousand. And now 2,000 years later, over 2 billion people profess faith in Jesus Christ. Guys, that is the power that loving God and loving people can have when we focus on true north. So just imagine how your world, micro world, how it might change. Your relationships with mom, with dad, with husband, with wife, with friends, with family, with co-workers. Imagine how that might change. Imagine how your relationships in your community group and maybe your distant cousins. Imagine how that might change. But imagine macro. Imagine the world. Imagine how it might change when we focus on true north. Invite people to come by the way we love them and say, hey, this is the one who changed everything for me. Can you imagine what Jesus might do? Let me pray for you today. Father, I thank you for Jesus being our true north. I thank you for the way that you loved us so much that you came, God in the flesh, through Jesus to come, to love us, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for our sin. And God, to give us a chance to be redeemed and reconciled to you for the perfect relationship so that we might know you. So God, I pray today for any of us who are distracted by Magnetic North, for those of us who are distracted and detracted and all these things away from you, that we would realize how good you are, how sweet your love is, and it would draw us so close. God, you would draw us so near that it would change everything about us. And God, who we know in you would always show to the world around us. So Father, we pray that you would move in our hearts today, that you would change us, give us your power for us to go and change the world. We love you so much. And in the true north, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.